You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. In the book of Acts that is probably familiar to most of you, it is probably more familiar than maybe some of the other passages that we've looked at in the book of Acts up to this time. And it is probably more familiar than many of the passages that we're going to be looking at in the book of Acts all the way through to the end. And it is familiar because it is striking. It stands out in our consciousness. You read the book of Acts and to be honest with you, it just does not seem to fit. It doesn't seem to fit the flow. It doesn't seem to fit the environment and the feeling that you get in those first four chapters. Acts chapter 5, the first 11 verses just kind of strike us as odd and out of place. And for this reason, in Acts chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, we get the story of this band of disciples that have grown from 12, possibly 120, all the way through to the point where they're not even giving any numbers. Luke just has stopped numbering them entirely. The last number we got was 5,000 men, not including women and children, but 5,000 men. And it's been a successful church. They have successfully overcome the opposition and the threats that they've received from those who are in authority toward the leadership of the church. It has emboldened them and they have become more bold in their proclamation of the truth about Christ. And the church continues to enjoy favor in the sight of all of the people and opposition from the religious leaders. And it continues to grow. And then last week we saw the unity that existed amongst those early Christians, the oneness of mind and heart that they had, and how that manifested itself in in selling their possessions and sharing them with the poor so that in chapter 4, verse 34, Luke says there wasn't a needy person among them. And everything is blissful, everything is beautiful, everything is going along perfectly, and then you come to Acts chapter 5, and you feel like you're hit in the face with a cup of cold water. Ananias and Sapphira. How does that fit? You know what Luke's doing? He does not want you to get overly romantic with the early church. Listen, they had problems too. As long as you have people, you have problems. And they had problems in the early church. And lest you get to the point where you think, man, I just wish I could go back and be part of the early church. That They really had it together. There was no sin back there. There was no people problems. There was no issues. There was no strife. Listen, you got an account of sin in chapter 5 and an account of potential strife in chapter 6. And wait till we get to chapter 15 where Paul and Barnabas part ways. People problems. Don't fall too in love with this early group of people because, listen, they had their issues too. And Ananias and Sapphira were an issue that had to be dealt with. Now, we've seen how Satan has attacked the church. First, externally, physically, right? Threats. It's an external attack from those who are outside of the church with threats basically of physical harm or physical violence toward the apostles. That didn't work. So now Satan turns his sights on something else. He's going to go inside the church And rather than threaten it physically, he's going to threaten it morally. And God moves very quickly to deal with the moral compromise in the church. And that's the account we get in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. So we're going to observe three things there. The first thing I want you to notice is the contrast that exists. Now we're actually going to pick it up back in chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, because there's an unfortunate location of a chapter break there at the end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5. It would be nice if those verses were, were the chapter break kind of was moved back a little bit to be before chapter 4, verse 36. When we got at the end of chapter 4, we saw that the early Christians were selling their possessions and giving them to the poor, or giving them to the apostles to be distributed amongst the poor. Then we get to Acts, the end of Acts chapter 4, and we get a positive example of that and a negative example of that. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Pick it up with me there. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. This is the positive example. A man named Joseph. He's a Levite. Now the Old Testament had 
stipulations, the Levites couldn't own land. Barnabas, for whatever reason, owned some land. Did he inherit it from his wife? Did he inherit it from an uncle? Did it get given to him? Did he just pick it up? Did he buy it? We don't know, but maybe by this time that prohibition against Levites owning land had been let aside. But now, Barnabas, who is a Levite, owns a tract of land. He's of Cyprian birth, which means he was born on the island of Cyprus. His name is Joseph. And the apostles nickname him Barnabas. Why do they nickname him Barnabas? They discern something in him, a character trait, a giftedness, a propensity toward encouragement. And so they nickname him Son of Encouragement or Barnabas. Barnabas was one of those individuals who was always running around encouraging people. He had that spiritual gift. You know the type of people? You get cards from them in the mail. They give you a little gift just when you're plodding along and you think nobody notices what you're doing and you're down and the Lord works through that individual who is a channel of His encouragement to sort of lift your spirits a little bit. Where would the church be without Barnabases? There's lots of Barnabases in our body. People who have the gift of encouragement. And I would say to you, use that gift. Because for every church where there's no Barnabas, friends, that is a that is a dark place to be. They, they need Barnabases in the church. Barnabas was that kind of individual. Joseph. And he was close enough with the disciples that they give him a nickname. You don't nickname people that you're not familiar with or you don't know. You don't just meet somebody and then give them a nickname. The apostles knew Barnabas well enough to give him the nickname uh, Joseph well enough to give him the nickname Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And he's with the apostles. And listen, he's in, introduced here intentionally because this is the same Barnabas that goes with Paul later on in the book. That's this Barnabas. Now, that's Barnabas. That's his bio. And what does he do? Verse 37 says that he owns a tract of land. He sold it. And he brings all of the proceeds from that sale and he lays it at the apostles' feet to be distributed amongst the poor. And that's it. He's the positive example of how that practice of selling goods, giving them to the apostles and taking care of the needy, he's a positive example of how that worked out. Now we have a real unfortunate case. And here's the contrast with Ananias. And listen, don't let the chapter break fool you because these two men are put up as stark opposites so that you can see a positive and you can see a negative. Now we're given all of Barnabas's sort of genealogy is biographical information. He had a nickname. He had the gift of encouragement. He was born on Cyprus. He was son of a Levite. He was a Levite. His name was Joseph. All of that information. All we know about Ananias is that his name was Ananias. Why is that? Barnabas plays a major role in the rest of the book of Acts. All the way through to chapter 15. Does Ananias play a major role in the rest of the book of Acts? What do you need to know about Ananias? (laughs) His name. That's it. You don't need to know anything else about him because he doesn't show up again in chapter 6 or chapter 7 or chapter 8 or chapter 9. This is the first we read of Ananias. And this is the last we read of Ananias. Here's what he did. Chapter 5, verse 1. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, and by the way, you won't read about her again after chapter 5 as well. With his wife Sapphira, they sold a piece of property and they kept back some of the price for themselves Ananias did this with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, externally, he did exactly what Barnabas did. Both men owned a tract of land. Both men sold it. Both men brought money to the laid it at the apostles' feet for taking care of the poor. But Ananias' act was slightly different. He had a piece of land. He sold it. He took back some of the price of that land. He brought the rest of the apostles' feet and he gave it to them for distributing uh, distributing among the poor. He didn't give all of it. He gave some of it. Is there anything wrong with doing that? Nothing wrong with doing that. What was wrong about what Ananias did? Here's what he did. Let me put numbers to it. He owned a tract of land. Say it was worth $50,000. He said... Barnabas sold a tract of land, brought it. Other people are doing this, and this is going over well in the church. Ananias did the same thing. He sold his tract of land, say he got $50,000 for it. He took that $50,000. He kept back some for himself, say $25,000. Brought the other $25,000 to the apostles and said, I sold my tract of land for $25,000. And I'm bringing you the entire price of what I received for that piece of land. Here it is. That's what he did. Now, you notice that Luke doesn't tell us any figures. You notice that? doesn't tell us how much the land was worth. doesn't tell us how much Ananias sold it for. 
does not tell us how much Ananias brought or how much Ananias kept back. Luke does not even tell us the percentage of what Ananias kept for himself or the percentage of what he brought to the apostles' feet. He kept back some and he brought the rest. No numbers attached to it. Why is that significant? You know why that's significant? It doesn't matter how much it was. It doesn't matter if Ananias kept $5 for himself or $5,000 for himself or $25,000 for himself. The point of the story is not how much was brought and how much was kept back. The point of the story is the motive and the intent of Ananias. He brought some representing it to be all to the apostles. That's just such a slight compromise of truth, is it not? That is ever so slight. If he had sold the land for $50,000 and kept $5 for himself, and he brought it to the apostles and said, I sold the land for $49,995 and here is all of it. It would have been the same as keeping half or keeping 80% or keeping 99%. The amount does not matter because a lie is a lie is a lie. Hypocrisy is hypocrisy. Half-truths are half-truths. Deceit is deceit. And that's what Ananias did. Now, outwardly what he did was the exact same thing as Barnabas. Both owned land. Both sold it. Both brought money. But what Luke zeroes in on is the intent of Ananias' heart. Why did he do what he did? You know what I think it was? I think Ananias secretly wanted the same applause, recognition, um, appearance, whatever it is that Barnabas had. But he wanted it without the sacrifice. He wanted to appear sacrificial without being sacrificial. He wanted to look generous without really being generous. He wanted to look like he was doing what everybody else was doing, but secretly his love was money. His love was material possessions. And so Ananias wanted to look like Barnabas, but he didn't want to sacrifice like Barnabas did. So he sold it and kept back some of it and allowed other people to think he was more generous than he was really being. He wanted other people to think that he was being more sacrificial than he was really being. It was all about appearances, not helping the poor. It wasn't about helping the poor. It was about his appearances. How did he look in the eyes of other people? There's no other reason why he would do what he did. Because you'll see later on what the real problem with his actions was. But he wanted that sacrifice. That's the contrast that exists between Barnabas and Ananias. Now look at the confrontation. Boy, we're going to get some rain or lightning here, huh? Look at the confrontation beginning at verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it you've conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Somehow Peter perceives what is going on here. Somehow when Ananias brings the price, the bag of coins or whatever it is that he brought and handed over to the apostles, Peter was able to perceive, I think without him saying anything or doing anything, Peter was able to perceive what was going on in the heart of Ananias. How did he know that? The Lord revealed that to Peter, obviously. And so Peter confronts him. And he hits the nail right on the head. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, was Ananias a believer? Some people say he was. Some people say he wasn't. I think Luke intends for us to understand that Ananias was a believer. Why? Because Luke includes him with the congregation of those who believe that he mentions up in chapter 4. The congregation of those who believed were together of one mind, of one heart, and this is what they did. Ananias was amongst the congregation of those who believed. Second, Ananias had some sort of dealing with the Holy Spirit because he lied to the Spirit of God. There was some sort of interaction between Ananias and the Spirit of God in which Ananias was lying to the Spirit and he knew it. And third, he's doing what everybody else in the congregation is doing, and if Ananias is not a believer. This is no object lesson for Christians because Christians in the church would have said, he is an unbeliever. It's no wonder God struck him down for being dishonest. He wasn't saved. But that's not what happened. When God struck Ananias down for doing what he did, it was an object lesson to all of the other Christians. Ananias was a believer. And I think 
that this is intended for us to take him as a believer because Luke doesn't give us any indication that he wasn't. I think Ananias and his wife were both believers. How is it that a believer's heart is filled with Satan or that Satan can fill the heart of an unbeliever? That has nothing to do with possession, friends. It has nothing to do with Satan possessing an individual. It has to do with influence and control. Ananias had yielded enough influence and enough control and had yielded enough to Satan that it was Satan who had put this deed in his heart. But listen, it wasn't Satan's fault because later, later Peter says, why have you conceived this deed in your heart? Right? So it was both Ananias and Satan who were working in conjunction with each other. Obviously, Ananias doing the bidding willingly, unaware that it was actually Satan who had filled his heart with this intent and this control to do what he did. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then notice what Luke says, or what Peter says, you have not lied to men, verse 4, but you've lied to God. Now drop that verse in the lap of the Jehovah's Witness next time he's dropped by your house and tells you that there's no such thing as the Trinity and the Holy Spirit is not God. You have lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter says in verse 3. You have lied to God, verse 4. That's the person of the Spirit. He affirms the deity of the Spirit. Now notice how Peter gives us the problem with Ananias' action. He says, when before it was sold, it was yours. And after it was sold, it remained under your control. In other words, nobody placed the requirement to sell the land on you, Ananias. It was your land. You could have sold it or you could have kept it. And nobody would have thought any differently of you. And after it was sold, did it not remain your possession? In other words, you made the transaction, you received the money for it. And the money was in your possession. Ananias was free to keep back as much of that money as he wanted and give as much as he wanted to the poor. It was his land. It was his money. And if Ananias had just gone to Peter and said, I sold the land for X amount, I have kept X amount for myself for some renovations on my home, and I am giving the rest to the poor, everything would have been fine. He was free to sell it. He was free to keep all of the money. He was free to keep some of the money. What he was not free to do was to misrepresent what he had done to make himself look better than he really was. That's what he was not free to do. So Peter says, it was yours. Well, before it was sold, after it was sold, it was yours. Why in the world would you do that? You could have given five dollars and kept four hundred and ninety or forty nine thousand all to yourself and given us five. And we wouldn't have thought any less of you. What Ananias did was generous, was it not? He gave money to help the poor. But he was generous and duplicious. He was generous and he was deceitful. Something was going on behind the scenes that he didn't want anybody to know about. And Peter puts his finger on it, and he confronts Ananias. And then look what happens in verse 5. You've not lied to men but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. He dropped dead. And listen, folks, I have read all kinds of bizarre things this week of people who try and somehow make this palatable to us. They try and explain to us how it is that Ananias died. Ananias was so overcome by surprise that Peter knew what was going on behind the scenes. Ananias was so shocked at the idea that Satan could have done something in his heart that he just up and had a heart attack and died right there in front of Peter. They do that in order to, in order to sort of soften it, as if God does not reserve the right to take the life of one of His creatures. As if God does not reserve the right to judge sin in His church. You know what happened? Ananias dropped dead right there in front of Peter while Peter was speaking those words. No sooner had Peter uttered the last syllable, Ananias breathed his last. And that word breathed his last is only used three times in all the New Testament. All three times it's used of somebody being struck down by God. It's used here of Ananias. It's used also in this chapter of Sapphira. And then it's used over in Acts chapter 12 of Herod who says that the angel of the Lord struck him and he was eaten with worms and he died because he was struck dead by God. What happened to Ananias? Did he have a heart attack out of shock? No. God struck him dead. That's it. I'm sorry if that offends you, but that's exactly what happened. He sinned. He was duplicious. He was deceitful. Peter confronted him. Gave him no opportunity to repent, by the way. He didn't say when Ananias brought the bag up, Ananias, is there something on your heart you would like to tell us about before you give this money? Is there anything you'd like to get off of your chest before we distribute this to the poor? Peter didn't do that. 
He just confronted him, and dead he went. Dropped dead right in front of him. And it says that the young men came in, they covered him up, they took him out, and they buried him. And that's kind of odd to be buried the same day, isn't it? It wasn't odd in that culture. It wasn't odd in that region. They buried them, buried them the same day that they died that day, time, often because of the heat in the area. It's such an ar- arid and dry and hot area that they would bury them the same day. And that's what they did. And also, in the Old Testament law, it was required that if somebody died under the curse of God, they were buried the same day so as not to defile the land. So the men, young men bring him out, and they bury him, and this happens quick. So quick that Luke says, Sapphira, his wife, didn't even know what happened. Because three hours transpired. Look at the text. Three hours transpired. And an interval of three hours. And his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Three hours have gone by. And Sapphira has no idea what's going on with her husband. Now that's kind of odd, isn't it? Because I asked myself, Where was Sapphira during all of this? What was she doing? How can she not know after three hours? You would think that word of an event like that would spread so quickly that wherever Sapphira was at, she'd have heard it. You would think that somebody there in the church that day would see this and they would be out the door finding her, hunting her down in the marketplace, at home, at the relative's house, out in the field, wherever she was at, and that they would let her know. But somehow, three hours go by, Sapphira doesn't know anything of what's happened to her husband. It's been kept quiet. Now some people, and I actually read one guy who said, this shows you just how hard-hearted Peter was in his early years. He really had not developed a pastoral heart, and if he had had more time and experience under his belt, Peter would have been a lot more gentle with Sapphira in announcing to her her husband's death. And Peter probably would have sent one of the other apostles out to comfort her. And I mean, here after all, she, her husband dies, she's not invited to the funeral. She doesn't make any, she not even goes to the graveside, doesn't make any funeral arrangements, she's not even informed about it. How do you explain something like that? I think Peter knew how deep this conspiracy of deceit went. And I think it was kept secret for the very purpose of exposing her sin and bringing judgment upon her. I think that when the Spirit of God revealed to Peter what Ananias had done, Peter knew it went all the way to Sapphira. And Peter's intention was to allow God to meet judgment out on both of them. So I think what happened was the church was just quiet. You're silent. Whenever God's judgment comes or discipline comes, the thing to do is to be silent. In your house, when you discipline one child, the last thing you expect is for the rest of them to protest, right? You're disciplining your youngest and the other three are walking around with signs, unfair, unfair, we deserve equal rights, equal treatment, blah, 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 protesting on behalf of the other one. No, no. Listen, in the sight of righteous, loving discipline, you remain silent. You don't pity them. You be quiet and you let the Lord do what the Lord's going to do. That's, I think, what the church did. They're just quiet. Sapphira comes in. Everybody knows what's happened. Sapphira steps up to the front. Peter, I think, pointing at the money, because you'll notice Luke doesn't ask her for an amount. Did you sell the land for this? It's probably still right there, and Peter points at Is that what you sold the land for? Was there conviction at that moment? Was there something in her heart and her mind where she was wrestling with the Spirit? She doesn't know what's happened to her husband. If she knew what had happened to her husband, I think her answer would have been different, don't you? But she doesn't know. For this purpose, to see if she will continue in her sin. And we don't know if she felt conviction or remorse or guilt. Is that what you sold the money land for? Yep. That's it. Ananias didn't have to say anything. He comes in, drops the money. Peter confronts him. But with Sapphira, he gives her an opportunity and she verbally lies to him. Yep, that's what we sold the land for. That's the whole price of it right there. Now, if she had turned state's evidence before Peter, if she had come clean with it, it would have made her husband look terrible. So there's because she doesn't know what's happened to her husband, she doesn't know that Peter knows She still thinks that she can get away with the lie and the deception and she's going to keep all of this wrapped up together and her and Ananias are going to stand side by side. Well, they are going to be side by side eventually. They're buried side by side because they sin side by side. And Peter gave her opportunity to come clean and she didn't come clean. Listen, sin is such a mysterious thing. Sin makes us think 
and say and do things that are almost insane. And that's what sin does. And here's a woman coming into the presence of the apostles, lying for her husband, doing the most insane, juvenile, ridiculous things, all because her heart is darkened. And sin puts out this little carrot and it lures us in, promising us peace, promising us blessing, promising us fun and freedom, and all the time it makes us its slaves. And her heart is so darkened and her mind is so darkened and she's so far gone now that she just verbally says, yeah, that's it. And she doesn't utter another word. And look what Peter says to her. In chapter 5, or chapter 5, verse 9, Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Why? That little three-letter word is so searching, isn't it? All of a sudden, everything she's done, all of their plotting, all of their manipulation, all of their deceit, the whole cover-up, everything, the motive and everything seems so juvenile all of a sudden, doesn't it? Why did you do this? What could you possibly hope to accomplish? What could you possibly hope to get out of this? Why is it that you and your husband have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? And she doesn't even have opportunity to answer him. And Peter says, Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last, and the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Once again, Everybody says she was so shocked at hearing that her husband was dead that she had a heart attack and died too. No. God struck her dead. Now, does this whole account offend you? Does it strike you as out of character for God to do such a thing? Does it strike you as out of character for Peter to do such a thing? I mean, after all, this is the same man who had experienced the grace of the Lord in denying the Lord Jesus and then being restored to fellowship and love and being given a position of leadership. You would think that somebody who had who had himself sinned in so great a way and then had been restored to this would be much more gracious, much more loving, much more generous toward Ananias and Sapphira. Does this strike you as odd? Let me ask you to consider a few things about this. First of all, this incident had to be dealt with. This is a satanic attack on the church. And this had to be dealt with. Because fellowship and unity and generosity are built on trust. Are they not? Can you really have fellowship, koinonia, New Testament, loving fellowship with people that you do not trust? Can you have that? You can't. Fellowship is built on trust. Unity in a church is built on trust. Trust is built on openness and honesty and integrity and character. And if you don't have those things, you can't have trust. And if you don't have trust, you can't have fellowship, you can't have unity, and you can't have generosity. This had to be dealt with. Why? Because the church is unified, the church is generous, the church is is fellowshipping together, and this incident threatens all of that. It threatens the very moral, moral fabric of the church. And if they cannot deal with this, then into their midst would creep all kinds of deceit. And everybody outside the church from the very beginning would have said, the church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites, because I know Ananias sold me that piece of land for X amount. He kept some for himself and the apostles didn't catch it had to be dealt with right at the beginning. Because it threatened all of that. It threatened the integrity of the church. The fellowship. The sin had to be dealt with. And listen, friends, the incident shows us the seriousness of sin. That our sin is not necessarily only against each other. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, said, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is wicked in your sight. That's why Peter said, you haven't lied to men. You've lied to God. You may be able to pass it off, Ananias, in front of all of these people, but there's one individual who sees your heart. And all of a sudden, Ananias and Sapphira and the entire church is suddenly aware that there is this whole realm that is seen only to myself and to God called motive and intent. And that matters in the sight of God. It had to be dealt with. It threatened them. And listen, folks, the church needs to be reminded that you and I exist for the glory of God, not vice versa. He does not exist for us. He does not exist to fulfill my needs. He does not exist for my glory 
or my end or my means or my betterment or my peace or my comfort or my satisfaction. He does not exist for any of that. We exist for His glory. And the church needed to be reminded of that. Ananias was not going to be able to use the benevolent ministry of the church as a grandstand for showing himself off and deceiving everybody in the process. And if this had been allowed to stand, you know what would have happened? Everybody who was genuinely generous and genuinely interested in the poor would have said the benevolent ministry of our church is nothing but a sham. It's been made a mockery because all these people use it as an opportunity to show themselves off. And then they would have stopped giving to it entirely. That's what would have happened. It had to be dealt with, and God dealt with it swiftly. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we ought to mortify sin. You can imagine that this had some consequences, don't you think? Verse 11 is the consequences. And this was mentioned up at the end of verse 5 too. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Boy, howdy. You think? Can you imagine if that happened today? What would happen to us? Uh, Let me give you a scenario. Let's just picture something for a second. We're having a congregation a consecration Sunday. The place is filled with our body. We're here. We have we have worshipped. We have sung to the Lord. We are giving uh, money to be used for the new facility, and we are together on our consecration Sunday. And we get done with the message, and we are ready to offer ourselves and our finances to the Lord to be used in that facility. And as the plate is passed right up here near the front of this middle row, there's a man sitting next to you. You're sitting up here too. There's a man sitting next to you who pulls out an envelope out of his coat pocket and it's thick and it's packed tight. And you could tell that if he opened that thing up, he couldn't fit another bill in there. And it is just hard, packed full of bills and it's sealed tight. And he thumps it a couple times on his hand and it's got his name written in all capital letters in red on the front and on the back. And he's one of the first people and as the plate goes by, he drops that in the plate, boom, boom, down it goes like that. And and uh, it passes along and everybody is able to see that and he's proud of what he has done, and it gets to the end of the row, and he gets to the end of his life. Boom! Dead he drops. And later on, we find out that the envelope was filled with $1 bills. He wanted to look generous in front of everybody. And he gave to the Lord, but the whole thing was a mockery and a sham. What would that do to you? You're having communion some Sunday. You're sitting there in the pew. The elements are passed. The juice is there. It goes from the person next to you, you take your juice and it goes on and the person next to you drinks his juice and I finish praying and everybody looks up and he's dead. The guy sitting right next to you, dead. Later on we find out he was living in an adulterous relationship. And he had had, played, had adultery the night before. He was planning another adulterous encounter that evening and he had come together with the Lord's body and made a mockery and a sham out of the Lord's Supper and confession and wanted everybody to think how spiritual he was and he partook of the elements right there in front of everybody and he died as a result of it. What would that do to you? All of a sudden we'd take sin a lot more seriously, wouldn't we? There'd be a whole lot more self-examination going on. And you'd think twice before you partook of communion, wouldn't you? The next time? And you'd think twice before you gave again at the offering box, wouldn't you? To make sure that your motives were pure and they were right, God still reserves the right to take our life because of sin. He still reserves that right. Because we exist for His glory, not He for ours. And we ought to be passionately pursuing holiness and walking in integrity and in light and in openness before everybody and mortifying sin in our lives and hating it. Why? Because we ought to resist sin to the point of shedding blood because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 to the Corinthian church, because of what you're doing at the Lord's Supper, there are some among you who are asleep, some among you are sick, and a number of them have fallen asleep. A number of them have died because of what they were doing at the Lord's Supper. And God will still use that to chasten His body. And I believe that He sometimes does. It has a purifying effect on the church. I ask myself, I wonder if Peter was thinking of this incident when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. I wonder if he was thinking of Ananias. I wonder if Peter had in the back of his mind Ananias when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, quoting Psalm 34, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. 
but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You want to see good days? You want to see long life? Peter says, keep your tongue from evil and your mouth from practicing deceit. Ananias' sin was real simple. He made himself out to be something that he wasn't. A harmless white lie? I don't think so. It was deception. Brought his wife into the deception with him, and it cost both of them their lives for the purity of the church. That's a good exchange, by the way. What should you and I do? You and I should examine ourselves to see if our business dealings, our personal finances, and our motive in everything is pure. Do you come to church here on Sunday morning because you want everybody else to think you're spiritual? Is the reason you come to church here to simply keep up appearances and give everybody the impression that you're walking with God when in the off hours you're not really? What's your motive for service? Do you serve in the capacity in which you serve so that everybody else will see you and think something of you that's not true? Or do you serve the Lord out of the purity of your heart, out of a love and devotion for Him, with pure motives and pure intent, openness and frank and honest in front of everybody? Where are you at in there? Is it all a facade? David said, Psalm 51, you desire truth in the innermost being. And I asked you this morning, how's your innermost being? Is it hiding behind a facade? If so, right now is the time to deal with that deceit. Because you may lie to the rest of us, but you're also lying to God. And He can see right through it. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word and for the striking example that is in it. We would be tempted to think that we could get away with things before You because You do not all the time judge sin immediately. And we buy into the lie of thinking that we can deceive You, we can pull off a charade or a sham and get past You and It's amazing what we think we can do, but there's nothing hidden from your eyes. All things are laid open and bare to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account, Hebrews says. And we recognize that this morning and pray that you would remind us of that and search us and see if there be any wicked way in us. And then once you have found that, Father, we pray that you would reveal it to us and lead us to the rock that is higher than we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.